of our podcast channels and we will be posting this live on the youtube channel i would like to welcome everyone to you um you be the judges um we're here every wednesday at 6 p.m um i just got in my seat so i'm rushing through traffic so excuse my little late tardiness but um first of all i want to thank everyone who's joining us and everyone who is listening to us and will listen and share and like and love and 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 have conversations um, ultimately, this is about information, understanding, and action. I want to thank my lovely co-hosts, Marilyn Pierre and Judge Claudia Barbara. Um, <laughs> it seems like we've been doing this for a little bit. And before we get started with our lovely guests, and I see they're on, and I'm super excited about that, I have to ask my lovely Marilyn, how's your week been? Oh, my week has been great. I was saying that now I'm actually in Ohio because I have business in Ohio tomorrow, so I have to drive early, make sure I got settled in to you know get everything done to get us ready for tonight. So I'm excited about that. I am going to ask you how you are, and then there's something that I want to talk about. <laughs> well, great. Go ahead. So how are you? I'm I'm well. I'm always trying to do what I can for community and 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 the the education of people to clear up a couple of things. As, as if most people don't know, the United Nations are in session. So, um, and I get some reports from the Security Council because of, the, of my connections to there, and um, it, it's it's it's. It's great information, but it's also disturbing because we're, you know, most of the things we are in when we hear about the Russia and the Ukraine, we are in a, we're not in a global war, but we are in a war that it is pushed on to the West and, and it has affected us. It will affect us economically. It will affect us politically. It will affect us locally because we're part of the global community. And I don't, and I, I, we all, we'll have to talk about that in a different show of how does it affect us locally and community wise with the with the issues going on in in the Ukraine and and, and the wars that are going and, and Russia's war and what and Putin just had a conversation with his people um, about um, what would happen if if. NATO does what NATO is trying to do with increasing its forces, and he, he slightly mentioned nuclear weapons, but we always know that the United States is the only country in the world that has ever used a nuclear weapon, so uh, we won't go with a lot of disinformation. But other than that, I, I'll, I'll ramble on, but what's your question, Marilyn? Well, now I feel like I need to comment, because... Uh, based on what I've been hearing on the news, there seems to be a state of desperation uh, for Russia and what I've been hearing. And when people are in a position where they feel that there's no way out, who knows what they might do? Sometimes they don't even recognize themselves when they act in certain ways. So and then I'm, I'm looking at this as well, saying from Evangelist Minor asking that you celebrate your anniversary. No. But no. Oh, eh? Are you oh are you talking about me? Because last Sunday was my anniversary. It was your anniversary, oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So last Sunday I every September eighteenth I celebrate three things. I celebrate my birthday. I'm fifty seven. I celebrate my anniversary of coming into this country yep. on my 10th birthday, which if you do the math, is 47 years, so that's easy. <laughs> and then I also celebrate my wedding uh, day, which is 29. So yeah, so we had a lot to celebrate on, on that one day. I figured the 364, you know, is for everybody else, but that one day is all oh mine. Yay! <laughs> well, except I've got to share it sometimes with my siblings and my husband, but you know, I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> so thank you very much for remembering you, Evangelist Minor. That's really kind of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And yes, I had great fun. And yes, it is wonderful to be alive. Woohoo! <laughs> and unfortunately, because some people are having difficulties, yes. what I wanted to talk about was, was uh, Oh gosh, now, now I'm forgetting her name because I'm, I'm so excited over being reminded of what a great time I had on Sunday. Uh, Piper Lewis, you know, the 17 year old who was ordered to pay $150,000 to the family of her, well, of her rapist, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, because she killed him. Well, she admitted to killing him. No, that kind of stuff. We all, we all know that. But talk about laws that need to change. I mean, they said that because Iowa 
does it have well i i un, under iowa law restitution is mandatory and so therefore the judge had to order her to pay restitution to his family because uh, she, uh, because the Iowa doesn't have safe, safe harbor laws, which provides, um, um, uh, 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 which provides uh, people who are trafficked uh, some sort of immunity against that restitution. That's the bad news. The good news is that if there, if you could see a silver lining um, in this case, is that people were so outraged by you know, a trafficking victim having to pay restitution. her rapist's family restitution that they so far have given $450,000. So she has enough to pay the one fifty dollars that the, uh, that the court ordered plus have $300,000 more. So I know last week we talked about laws that seemed to be askew, and yes. this one definitely seemed to be askew. I mean, it's bad enough. She's 15, being trafficked, raped repeatedly by this guy, and then she has to turn around and pay his family restitution for the loss that they suffered by, because she killed her rapist. Anybody else want to, wants to comment about that quickly before we get to our guest? Well, the comment is okay. that, let's go with this. Uh, you know, most of, uh, if people don't know, one of my staple things is that I, I, I teach against um, human trafficking, um, created a task force here in Maryland, D.C., and Virginia. Um, we've been doing it all over the United States and globally. Um, we have been um, getting people untrafficked in, in many other countries that we have um, done some great work. But ultimately, I just don't understand why that law even persists or is here to what was the purpose of it? It had to have been a purpose of restitution, and how does and why would that apply to a person who's been trafficked? I mean, I don't understand how they apply that. Well, the law itself to me makes sense, uh, but there needs to be some exceptions. And according to the judge, there were no exceptions under Iowa law. So, for instance, the law is there. Let's say there's a father of three who happens to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and somebody kills him. He's, you know, that means that those children, that spouse just has no one to take care of them. So the restitution is to compensate um, that, you know, that family for their loss. So the law makes sense. But in a situation where the so-called victim is also the aggressor right as in right. her situation it doesn't make any sense because you know if you know she's also a victim as well as the aggressor so so with you running for being a judge in montgomery county here and and in, in maryland and then judge claudia barbara and we talked about these judge issues and use and them using their discretion it's, it just seems like we, we got to have these conversations with judges, but we can never have these conversations with judges because they can do anything they want, which is an understanding. A lot of people don't really understand that. It's like, well, this is the law, but the judge has discretion. And these discretions that the judges use seem so arbitrary. It doesn't seem like what we would like to hear their thought process in their judgment because that's the only thing we can talk against. Is their thought process of the why? Well, actually, this one is a little bit different because usually we say that this is uh, a judge's discretion. The judge said that the judge did not, ha the court did not have any discretion because that's the law. So for something like that, they need to go back to the legislature and ask the legislature to put in some exceptions. You know, you shall pay if you are have been found to be. You know, guilty of this crime, you should pay restitution, except if you yourself were a victim, as in uh, Miss Lewis's situation. Wow, I, I it it's it, it's so harmful. It's so harmful so, to so many communities, to so many people, and I think these type of judgments creates anarchy. 
there's not much we can put our hopes on, whether it be political, with the executive branch, whether it be the legislative branch. But when it comes to the judicial branch, and we can't even put our hopes in the judicial branch, then we, we're throwing our hands up in the air and going, okay, now what are we supposed to do? Now, how, mm-hmm. can, how can we move forward as a community of people when we, we don't even get... It's not ruling in favors. It's just understanding the rulings. If we can understand mm-hmm. the rulings, then maybe we could stomach it, whether it's swallow it or whatever, but then be like, okay. But we're not even mm-hmm. getting that. But you know, the the interesting thing of what you're sharing is that you hit the nail on the head when you said it has everything to do with uh, judicial discretion in the sentencing phase. And that's where, you know, you have uh, this type of um, shocking outcome. And um, uh, a lot of times during the sentencing phases, The judges do spend a lot of time uh, listening to what the probation officer has to say, what the um, victim impact statements are, uh, and uh, all of that. They they, they get a whole large laundry list of of, um, explanations as to why the the sentencing should be what it is. You have the, the prosecution arguing one sentence, and then you have the defense arguing something else. Uh, but uh, it is left up to the judge. And yeah, it's it's very discretionary. And we, you, you, we sat through statewide equity meetings, Dr. Dyer and Mary Lynn Pierre, where we learned of a judge on the Eastern Shore <laughs> that made a discretionary sentence on a simple assault case uh, and, and gave someone 10 or 12 years for a street fight. Right. So, you know, uh, it, it does, um, you know, judges matter. You know, who is in the bench matters. So um, are we... Well, have- it, it really does, except that in this situation, this is Iowa, and there's no discretion. And that's why this one actually has to go to the legislature. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes that, that's the case, too. Mm-hmm. But we do have guests, and we want to... Yes, we do. To- yeah, yeah. And, and if do. I may introduce them, the, um, yeah. you guys want me to read your bio? Very impressive. We Briefly. have with us, Briefly. we have with us Miss Colette Watson. Thank you, Miss Watson, for being with us. She's the Media 2070 Director and Free Press's Vice President of Cultural Strategy. She helps guide narrative change, community partnerships, and strategic communications with artists, media makers creatives and advocates to shift power toward a just future media system. Before joining Free Press, Ms. Watson worked at Black Alliance for Just Immigration and in the New York office of J. Walter Thompson Advertising Company. A proud native of Gullah Country, I wanna hear more about that. (laughs) A proud native of Gullah Country, South Carolina, Ms. Watson is a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority and a graduate of Howard University School of Communications. Go Bison, woo! I'm a Bison myself, so so very happy to have you, Ms. Watson. We also have with us Ms. Vineka Williams. She is the Media 2070 Campaign Manager. Ms. Williams supports the Free Press team team in the development, design, and successful implementation of the Media 2070 campaign for media reparations. This includes liaising with coalition partners, fostering external relationships, supporting newsroom training, and developing a curriculum and necessary collateral materials. Before joining Free Press, Ms. Williams was engaged in faith and community organizing work in St. Louis. As a graduate of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Ms. Williams uses her talents to amplify black stories and liberate black lives. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ms. Watson and Ms. Williams. Thank you. So I, I, I got, before Ms. Watson talks, so she's a kakalaki. Right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> South Carolina, born and raised. Yes. <laughs> well, tell us more because I I am not versed in kakalaki. So please. Oh yeah, it's my pleasure. Uh, thank you for having us. 
Um, I was born in a town <laughs> called Georgetown, which is about 60 miles um, west of Charleston, South Carolina, which a lot more people are fam familiar with. And Charleston being a port city, um, much like Kingston or other cities around the globe that were places that our ancestors um, were brought to during the time of the African slave trade. And what you have in that area is a culture and a dialect known as Gullah or Gullah Geechee, which is really still a lot of um, what our ancestors brought with them um, in terms of the expressions, food ways. If you watch the series High on the Hog on Netflix, it explains a lot of that. And so that's my maternal family background. Well, I, I have to say I've had some of the best shrimp and grimps down in the Gullic area, so I and and I had had some hog down there. So, but we'll get, we'll talk about that later. I love the good food, eating. yeah, yes, good eating. <laughs> well, the, the reason we we brought you here is the twenty seventy project and the topic of media reparations. So, tell us what you're doing in that area and why it media reparations is. Uh, something to pay attention to. Absolutely. Well, you know, as I listen to the really excellent conversation around um, what is happening in terms of policies and, you know, how folks are navigating the criminal legal system or our understanding of issues like sex trafficking, all of these realities are shaped by narrative. Um, and what we expect of our judicial system, who we understand as a victim versus an aggressor, who we think has value, our understandings, understandings of race and politics and power, all of this is shaped by narrative. And the Media 2070 Project, which that's 2070 for the year 2070, is a vision of a world 50 years from now where um, we have realized media reparations and Black people in all of our diversity and complexity have control of our own narrative. And we're no longer at the mercy of the historical media narratives that really uphold a myth of Black inferiority and criminality um, and other kinds of stereoty stereotypes of our people. And so for us, the, it starts with understanding media harm and um, we released a 100 page essay during at the time of our founding two years ago, where we outlined historical examples of harm throughout history from the very first colonial newspapers, which actually gained their revenue and stayed afloat from selling ads for enslaved African people. And since that time, we know that the media system has continued to be rooted in anti blackness in ways that can that have directly shaped our ability to exist in society today. And we believe that reparations are owed for that harm, but we understand it as a process, not just a one-time thing. And so there's a lot that's involved with repairing that, that material harm and that spiritual harm that's happened throughout history. And we're engaged in the process of dreaming up what media reparations means in partnership with a lot of our uh, community collaborators. And I may have left something out, Vanikia, who's my amazing uh, partner in this work, so please do jump in with anything that I neglected to mention. Well, two things before Vinikia talks is, one, I'm on the reparations committee here in Montgomery County. And the other thing is you released a 100-page essay. 100 page? So who, yes. who's going to read this besides me? <laughs> well, you know, we have a lot of different uh, folks from a lot of backgrounds involved in our work, scholars and academics such as yourself, yourself, um, organizers, people who work in policy, community activists. And what we do is we really translate that essay into a lot of different forms. We have an audio book um, coming this October. We also have uh, shorter bites of, of content that we've been able to publish for everyone from Harvard Business Review to gosh, Essence Magazine, um, Yes Magazine, and where we are really constantly translating this concept of media reparations and applying it to real life situations and real life fights for justice. Um, and then we lift up those examples of harm that are in that 100 pages. We lift them up one at a time and talk about them in, in various settings for people to, to really understand how media um, impacts our everyday life, especially the narratives that it upholds. And, and I would be remiss if I didn't say that if folks want to read that essay or or maybe some of the smaller bites of content that we have, it's at media2070.org. 
but we're, we're, we're working on that, uh, Dr. Dyer, making it as accessible as possible to everyone. You know, you uh, oftentimes mention the word reparations, and for some people, they uh, find that word uh, a sensitive word because it sounds like someone is looking for a payback. So how do you respond to this concept of media reparations? Well, we, you know, for us, the way that we frame this process of reparations is first of all, understanding that harm has taken place. Black journalists have been denied opportunity. Black journalists have been targeted, um, even killed in the course of trying to tell our stories. Black owned media outlets like Ida B. Wells newspaper, the Memphis Free Speech, they've been burned to the ground, the Tulsa Star in Tulsa, Oklahoma, at the time of the Tulsa race massacre. You know, um, and then our folks who even in the present day have been trying to break into journalism or entertainment or book publishing are constantly shut out by gatekeepers. And we understand that right now, less than 5% of um, full power TV stations are black owned, less than 1% of radio stations. Um, Just the list goes on and on and on. But what all of this constitutes is harm to our folks. The, The lack of seeing ourselves reflected in ways that have nuance and truth and context. And so we understand that where there's harm, then the antithesis of harm is care. So it's not just about writing a check, though we understand that there is material recompense that must take place, but it's also about having a sense of the fullness of black humanity and media organizations recognizing that. But our specialist in that concept and that framework of care is Vanikia. So I I definitely wanna let you get in here. Oh, no, thank you. You framed this all so beautifully. Um, that essay that was referenced, not only does it chronicle years, years of harm done towards uh, and anti-Black racism done towards our communities, it also speaks of resistance. There have been people who have been fighting the good fight for a long while, and it's a call to continue that fight, to pick up that, um, that fight saying, I'm not asking for what isn't mine. And so when we talk about reparations, it's not giving me something that that wasn't uh, wasn't mine to begin with. It was unjustly stolen from from labor to lives um, and saying there is still something owed owed from past harms and then things that are still currently perpetuated until this day. Um, And so when we start talking about that, this all starts with an acknowledgement of all the harms that were done. And there has to be then some reckoning that's done. And people don't necessarily get to that phase of reckoning within this work, which is what we're calling a lot of folks to do before they even get to implementing and instituting systems of support and true care for what our communities need. Um, well, here, here is a, here is, I'd like to drop the video that you all shared with me at this time, if that's okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Make sure you hit um, um, share um, audio uh, on your share link. Otherwise, we won't be able to hear it, Judge Barber. Okay, thank you. Do you all see this? Yeah, so go back, start over again. And um, when you hit share, there's going to be share audio. So this way we'll hear it from your... um, Yes, stop share. Hit on stop share. Hit stop share. And then go back to share. And then on the bottom left, you'll see share audio. Okay. You got to click that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Look at Marilyn. We learn from each other. Yeah, Marilyn's Marilyn's getting all like tech savvy. Uh Uh-oh. She's going to open up a tech company. Exactly, because I learned from you. I'm usually social media. Um, I would prefer to go on to different apps, um, mostly um, black apps for us. Do you trust news? Nope. To me, it's all tabloid now at this point.
the stories that they show, it's not stories of us. It's mostly, you know, non-melanated people that I see. So if it could be more of us shown, then I would probably watch it more. I'm Elizabeth Montgomery and I'm a journalist. I define journalism as the community. It's a business, yes, it's a part of corporations, but it's really the community. We're telling the community stories. I am born and raised in Atlanta. My dad actually was the journalist that I looked up to growing up. He worked at newsrooms all across Atlanta and I grew up in those newsrooms. I was kicked out of my house at 18 and journalism was the one thing that I knew I could do. And I landed an internship at the Atlanta Voice newspaper and I worked there while I lived in my car. I got paid $25 a week to transcribe interviews. I got to write a couple interviews too at the Atlanta Voice. That's a black newspaper. It's the black press of Atlanta. And working there really taught me that my community has a voice, the Atlanta Voice. <laughs> and I really wanted to, it kind of instilled in me that the stories that need to be told are the stories that nobody really hears about. And so I uh, learned early on that telling black stories is what I'm passionate about and what I wanted to do going forward. I didn't go in wanting to be the person to highlight the black community or highlight communities uh, that are underrepresented. I went in just wanting to get a job in journalism and just be an awesome journalist. And But once I saw that this was an issue, I was like, somebody has to write these stories because I'm meeting people, I'm networking out there, and there are amazing people doing amazing things, but they're not in the media, in the news. They say they care about diversity and <laughs> they want the newsroom to reflect the community and so they do things so that the newsroom can reflect the community but they don't put the same uh support behind that um it gets it's kind of like yeah let's agree to this but we're not going to actually help this happen you know we're going to hire a bunch of people and not pay them as they should be getting paid the Lever survey, um, it was a survey of 101 respondents. The central hypothesis at the start of it was that journalists of color leave the industry at the mid-career point. So there's the, the narrative before this is that you just have to focus on training the journalists of color and that's enough. They, they'll come in once they have access, that's sufficient. And what this sample, what this survey shows is that that's actually not where the, the problem is. The problem actually may be the newsroom itself. When newsrooms are, are white dominated um, and there is there is not the diversity that reflects the community or that reflects the the demographics or the future of this country even. Um, it means that stories aren't told truthfully. There was a position that was open and I went for it. I asked, hey, can I do this? I think I would be great as arts and culture reporter. This is what I'm passionate about. I'm, I love writing. We've seen in the past how my stories do. And it took a while, but eventually they moved me into that position. I couldn't pay my rent. I couldn't buy groceries at the same time. It was either rent or groceries. For that to be my life as a journalist who had been reporting for over a decade, who got into journalism in 2006, it was just mind blowing to me that I'm not even, I don't even make enough to afford food at this point. Like. I'm not homeless, but I still can't eat. <laughs> it opened my eyes a lot because when that pay study came out and it showed that I make 20, at least 25,000 less than a reporter who has less experience than me. Going 
back to the Reagan years in the 1980s uh, through the Clinton years and the 1996 Telecom Act, which removed a lot of the limits on media ownership and the rules that were in place to ensure that local media was held in local hands. Uh, as soon as we got the Reagan administration, we had an FCC chairman who argued that the television is just another appliance, a toaster with pictures. This led almost directly to media consolidation. We see in 1985, immediately after public interest regulations were rescinded, we had Cap Cities purchasing ABC, Murdoch purchases 20th Century Fox, heavy concentration of ownership in local television by a few large corporations eroded the quality of news that Americans received. This was predicted by Pew after extensive studies in 2003. that Black Americans and Latino Americans are going increasingly to social media to try to get information about what's going on in their community, what's happening with things that they care about in their lives. And you see that you have more and more people of color relying on social media. Black communities are repeatedly targeted online for disinformation. 77% of Black Americans use at least one social media site for daily information. Uh, a higher percentage than for whites. Recent social media campaigns have targeted blacks to mislead black communities about the COVID-19 vaccine, deterring blacks from feeling safe about receiving it. There's a reason that Joe Biden came out and said that social media uh, platforms like Facebook are killing people. Um, they are particularly killing uh, black and brown Americans. Now, what it was that Biden, I think, exaggerated was failing to account, uh, to account for the entire communications ecology, not just social media, but the impact that it has on the lack of local newspapers, the lack of local news, the lack of information, uh, correct information that people could trust. indiscernible means that you are not seen and black people in Arizona have never been seen as migrants or refugees and so we don't get the same empathy the same support the same considerations as other migrants or refugees and certainly black people were recruited in the 1930s to come to Arizona and do migrant work and so they were migrants in that sense, but they were also refugees in the sense that lynchings were prolific. And I wrote to PBS and I wrote to um, NPR about the lack of black reporters, because essentially what the, the uh, broader media has done is they send white reporters out to collect black stories and filter them for white consumption. And that is uh, something that very much needs to change. Wanda Tucker, I'll never forget that interview because I pulled over on the side of the road to cry because she went to Angola to basically retrace her ancestors footsteps they were some of the first slaves that were brought to america and she lives in phoenix and usa today was doing a big um network wide story about her but her being in phoenix i was the one who was able to you know talk to her and and hear her story for a long time what happened when she was in angola and you know what it's like being back in phoenix and i wrote about that conversation that story ran on the front page of the Arizona Republic. I didn't feel valued at all. You're calling on me to write these stories. 
I'm writing a whole bunch of things that aren't even, that's not even part of my job. I'm making you look real good out here in the streets, but you don't value me enough to pay me what I deserve. You don't value me enough to pay me at least the same as someone one with less experience than me. Why am I getting paid $25,000 less than someone who just got out of college? <laughs> so we started in, in uh, late uh, 2019, but we were really small and just kind of figuring it out. And then COVID hit and we closed our doors and um, weren't really sure how we were gonna survive, how we we're gonna make it. Liz wrote a story about us and about us being the only um, Black-owned bookstore um, in Arizona, which I don't even think we realized at the time. The boost that we needed to that carried us from then, which was May of 2020, all the way until now, it was, you know, sometimes hundreds of orders a day. But none of that would have been possible without, um, one, the, uh, like I said, Black women, uh, but definitely uh, Liz being an integral part in that story. I got so many, so much praise from the community, but my job was like, you're not a good writer. They put me on, almost wrote me up because they said I wasn't a good writer. In every meeting, it was gonna be a situation or where we talked about me in a negative way. It was just terrible. I don't even have the words still. And it was belittling and it really turned me into a different person. It's like, I've been through a lot in my life, um, but I've always wanted to live and I've always wanted to, you know, fulfill my purpose. But at that paper, it was just like, what is my purpose? They don't doubt value me. They're underpaying me. I see it clear as day. Other people see it too. That entire three years that I spent was personally, it was some of the worst experiences that I've had um, for my mental health and just self-esteem, really. It's very sad. Oh. <laughs> it's very sad because this is what I... <laughs> In less than a year, uh, roughly 31 journalists have left the Arizona Republic and roughly 70% of those have been women or people of color. They would much rather cycle people of color in and out of the newsroom at bargain basement salaries and see how long they can keep them um, than to actually invest in keeping people of color. You know, our information systems have facilitated, you know, the emergence and maintenance of whiteness. Um, uh, as part of that economic growth and, and capitalism, they profited, you know, um, at an extreme rate from uh, these systems and these uh, relations of power. Um, they play a functional role in the, in the production and reproduction of capitalism. So these these infrastructures are making bank. They get rich. <laughs> they, you know, these some of these infrastructures, especially in this new technology, are producing white billionaires. So we we understand that these infrastructures are not neutral. We recognize that media reparation they're not only about recouping for past injury. They're also about transforming the current relations of extractive and exploitative power relations, if that, if that makes sense. And they require some level, some specific corrective actions, not just to correct the past, but to prevent the continuation of these practices in the future. So now I moved on with a new job and I'm excited and 
I make double what I was making as a reporter. It's not in journalism right now, but it's what I need for my life to move forward. Um, and I'm excited to move forward with that. And I hope to keep writing stories. As a writer, you know, the recurring theme of my life is I'm gonna keep writing no matter what. And I'm gonna keep telling the stories of the community. <laughs> going to stop it right there and uh, turn it back over to our audience uh, for feedback and the key takeaways that you may have have uh, have from from watching that um, uh, it, presentation. It's pissed off. You should we should be pissed. We should be highly inflamed. What other word can I use on this? You know what? I started this platform. If you be the judge, I asked Judge Claudia Barber and Marilyn to come on to do this show every Wednesday. I started my my platform of iHeart and Apple Tunes now going on five years. I've been doing me because I, I I felt the same way. This is information I've always known. I want to get our story out there, right? And get good stories out there and get talk to real people doing amazing things in, in our community, but in many communities. So it's not... but. He, and I'm not the only one that's done it because, like, one of the things I was like, I was working with a publishing company out of New York, and I'm like, you know what, I'm going to just do this myself. So I started my own, you know, YouTube channel and things like that. And, of course, like they said, social media. But I've always been upset with the the melanin people who have, who have not supported our own media. That troubles me. And without naming names, and everybody knows names of black women, black woman who's made billions, who's not supported black media. Mm -hmm. Do I have to name her name? Does anyone can figure her out? I mean, well, as I shared with it, Colette, it started um, with an O. And all okay, stuff. okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, as I was sharing with Colette some time ago. Uh, the 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 question of media reparations to me seems to focus on Elizabeth's story and the fact that yes. the Gannett newspaper got away with that and they will repeatedly and and here's the thing let's say we raise the flag right we 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 I'm not marching the damn thing again marching you know we we got to do better at you know. Run up and down the damn street, right? We got to do better with legislation. We got to be. But here's the thing: we have 46, close to 48 million black African Americans in this country, and we still don't support each other, and we still don't have the information. And and I made the 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 slight comical joke: who's going to read that? Because a lot of modern day blacks don't know our history, they don't read the stories, so they don't support stuff. They barely come out and vote, and now we want to get them to support. We're 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 like burning. We have candles burning everywhere, and it doesn't seem like it's lighting the path to awakening. But yet we get we, there's words being used out there called involuntary. What, what they call it? it's not slavery. It's involuntary. Movement, transfer, transfer, something. right? It's not slavery; it was involuntary transfer of people. It, it's but that story gets put out there, but our story doesn't get told. Well, the the good thing about the the clip is that it's yeah. enlightening. Yes, because a lot of people don't did not do not understand newspaper salaries, and they don't understand how Gannett was doing what they were doing. And the fact that they own so many newspapers. Um, the, the good thing about it is that uh, she shared that story about the, uh, the bookstore, yeah. uh, the black bookstore in Arizona. And it helped his business tremendously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, you know, I was so impressed and drawn in by just that piece of information. Now, when I go back to Arizona, I got to look for his bookstore and make sure I <laughs> stop by. 
Uh, but that's um, uh, that's the type of information that uh, mainstream media probably would never told me. And, uh, you know, the fact that it, it appeared uh, that she was working on the story, she did the story. And I was really feeling for her when she said that, you know, people uh, in this in the newsroom or whatever were saying negative things about her and and um, uh, making her feel down uh, and making her feel useless and, and not valued. So that's and, something and that's you see a, that. Yeah. Did, did you see that picture? Because she didn't even have to say that when you look at the picture of them in the newsroom right. and right. they're all bunched in together. She's like on the side. Yeah. You, you could basically just cut her out of the picture. Nobody would notice that she was there. So I didn't mean to interrupt you, Judge Barber. But no, that, no. You know, that, that, that's a whole lot about what was going on uh, in there. Okay, ladies, give us some solutions. Well, you know, one thing I think that is important for us to realize is that our folks are hurting. Um, our folks in newsrooms, our folks in community, we are holding generations of trauma. And when you talk about the ways that we show up or some of us don't show up in the process, a big part of that is this pain that we're in. And when you look at Elizabeth, um, and that was an astute observation of how she was a part in the photograph, the tears that she sheds in the story, you know, we talk about this in terms of dollars and cents, but there is also a deep, physical, spiritual, mental toll that um, people like Elizabeth go through. And it's apt that we're having this conversation today because this is actually Black Women's Equal Pay Day, which is a holiday that was created or an observance that was created to help us understand that it's not just Elizabeth, but Black women across not just journalism, but across all sectors um, for whom over the course of a lifetime, Black Enterprise says it costs us about $900,000 over the course of a lifetime on average. Um, that is the cost of unequal pay. And when you think about that means that that is the stress of trying to make ends meet. Most Black women are um, breadwinners for, for some level of family, whether it be sending money back home or taking care of our children or our grandchildren, um, caring for partners. You know, this is so when you're talking about black women being underpaid, that is taking a toll not only on that particular individual, but all of the people who may depend on her to some degree. And so well, that pain that's being passed down. And so when we talk about solutions, the first solution we believe is information, which as you know, Judge Barber was just mentioning, we hope that the information we present is enlightening to folks. But from there, it's solidarity and the community right. supporting um, media makers like yourselves here on You Be The Judge, folks who also find themselves, whether it be in independent media environments or corporate media environments like where Liz was, but supporting the people who are doing this work in a way that is grounded in community. Um, because we know that there are some folks who maybe, you know, share our identity, but are not connected to community, to your point from earlier, Dr. Dyer. But when folks are getting it right and, do, and doing that reporting that's needed and holding powerful institutions accountable, we can show up and we can support them. We can click, we can subscribe um, and do the things that help to keep them in that position. And when they are being treated unfairly, we can show up. Um, and then also we believe that the solidarity amongst Black media makers who do care about community and being grounded in um, liberation, that that solidarity within those newsrooms or within those communities, that that is important also. Um, I'll stop there. I think that's the first and biggest solution, though, that we offer is for people to be informed about what's happening and to band together to demand that these corporations and that the government, which creates the policies that shapes the media system, do better and 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 engage in direct repair of these harms. And when we get together and lift our voice in a in a um, collective way, we can't be ignored. But right now, too many of us look at the media as just a reflection of society, some kind of neutral observer. But it's not. It's a system of harm. I, I blame Jet Magazine. Okay. Whoa. Whoa. Why, why don't you do go with Ebony while you're at it? I do. I blame Jet. I blame Ebony. I, I blame them. I, I uh -huh. do. Black yeah. Enterprise. Oh, I would just like to say something. Go ahead. Okay. Bernadette, go ahead. Okay, bye. Hi, everyone. I haven't seen you all in weeks, you know. 
And thank you so much for this presentation. But no, you can't blame Jet Mag. You have to blame capitalism. That's Jet Magazine. I'm blaming no, Jet. No, because Jet Magazine has been caught up in a system where the companies do not believe that they will earn a profit from informing the population. I get it. That so they should have they should have pushed against it and and start they should have started letting us know in the 80s, 70s, but they didn't. They they held off and they tried to assimilate and then they got their ass caught up and jammed out. So I blame Jet. Okay. <laughs> well, you know something as well. Um, sorry. This is Teresa. I'm not on camera because I'm eating. But when I saw the video, it came to mind. Two things came to mind. One was a saying by Hans Morgenthau who said that power is control over the minds of men, which is what the media does. And another thing that came to mind was the African proverb that unless um, the lion tells his own story, then we have to get the story from the hunter who is always going to glorify his story. Mm -hmm. I just want to ask the question of how much of a role Tyler Perry, who has been deemed the media mogul, what is his what what do you have to say about him with regard to what you are talking about? That's a powerful question, Teresa. You know, I think Tyler Perry is an interesting example of the possibilities when we have control over our own media. And I, I say that because he does control his own studio, which in the production system, you have a lot of people who are famous actors that we see all the time and we think they are very powerful, but they don't have the power to green light their, produ their own productions, whether that be movies or TV shows. Tyler Perry can conceive of an idea for a show and control it from ideation through production out into distribution um, because he owns his own studio. But if you don't, if we don't agree with Tyler's viewpoints and, and, and his storytelling, that's off. okay. That's something separate. But he has shown us that there is an ability um, that, when, that when you own your own production studio, that there is a greater measure of control. The reason that I'm not going to get into whether or not I agree with uh, Tyler Perry is because I know that we are right now fighting for crumbs as black creators and producers. And that is why for Media 2070, the reparations frame is our basis because so much media wealth has been stolen when you go back even to the very first FCC licenses for broadcasting. Those were distributed during the time of Jim Crow segregation. So the first TV and radio broadcasting licenses which were given out freely because public airwaves are public property owned by all of us. We pay those good taxes, right? That that uh, property was given out freely to white men only in the 1920s and 30s. And so CBS, NBC, ABC are now these multinational conglomerates, as we showed in the in the um picture. And so that media wealth has been stolen and built exponentially. So we understand that if black creators had the abundant media wealth that has been stolen, and if we were resourced properly and not fighting and clawing our way into the media ecosystem, there would be so many more Tyler Perry's with so many more different viewpoints reflect, reflecting black women and black immigrants and black queer and trans folks and black youth and black elders. So many different types of voices that we don't get to hear, whereas there's a plethora of white stories. But for uh, folks of color, religious minorities, all the people within blackness, we are right now fighting for crumbs and arguing over the one or two examples of black people who have media control when there should be so many different black folks controlling our narratives that we it didn't, doesn't even occur to us that there's only one way of being. Great points. I, I appreciate your presence here today and enlightening us a lot on media reparations, the whole concept of the 2070 project, media project. It has really been... Uh, again, enlightening to the audience as to what struggles also, uh, you know, newspaper writers and journalists are experiencing in the newsroom. This clipping uh, apparently was um, done, in, uh, uh, I saw 2019, 
But I was I was also um, um, intrigued by the beginning when the question was asked, do you trust the media? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Been, I definitely don't trust the media. The, the media has been doing black flags on the United States for such a long time. Nah. What was that? Was that the FBI? Okay, first of all, if you did not know, um, guest, we always have the FBI listening on to our show, and that's because of Judge Claudia Barbara and Marilyn Pierre. It has nothing to do with any of the work I've ever done. And, and, and Dr. It, it, Dyer, right. you, you know they're, they're following you. You don't want to make them even know we existed. <laughs> so, um, so if you hear different buzzes, let you know you, you're on the list. This is McCarthyism. Even though we have all these black attorneys, we will still be put on a list. So don't worry about it. Just let you know your phone is being tapped as we speak. And um, and, and I just don't want any surprises. But before we leave on a heartbreak, I want to thank everyone for listening to You Be The Judge. We're here every Wednesday from 6 to 7 p.m. You can always find us on iHeart and iTunes and all your podcast channels. Just put in Bridges Live with Dr. Paul Dyer and you'll get in You Be The Judge. But before you leave, Claudia, at... I want you guys to talk about where can we find the essay, how can we get in touch with you, and where can we send money. Because ultimately, we can support, and we can click bait and all this other, but we need money. So let's get that out there. Absolutely. Vanikia, would, would you like to speak to that? Uh, for sure. So I did drop in the chat that you can go to mediareparations.org backslash essay if you're interested in seeing some of the things that have been talked about all the highlights that colette has been mentioning throughout can be found within that essay it was a labor of love and so hopefully you'll engage with that uh the main website mediareparations.org media2070.org will take you to the same place that'll tell you how you can stay up to date on what we're doing as a as a project That'll take you to our social media on Twitter and Instagram. Um, the links to donate can also be found on the website. Just as we're moving this forward, working with partners, making media re reparations both real and irresistible. Well, thank you. Um, we'll make sure we get that out and put in the link. Go ahead, Evangelist Minor. You're on mute. You're on mute. Uh Okay. Am I still on mute? Yep, no, we can hear you now. Go ahead, dear. Hey, if I heard correctly, I guess my question is, if information has been made accessible to black and brown people, how is it um, how is it that Facebook media has become a problem for black and brown people if this is their way of retrieving information well my quick answer and that's a great question would be that those algorithms that determine what you see when you log on those algorithms are design designed by facebook's engineers who are often people who hold biases against um, the black community, against various communities within blackness. And the ways that they program those algorithms often are designed, first of all, for the most profit possible. And then often what's gonna be most profitable is what's gonna make you the most emotional, which will keep you there present on that website for those advertisers. And what's gonna make you the most emotional oftentimes is lies, disinformation, things that are designed to make you um, hate your neighbor, you know, to make you look at black people or Muslims or immigrant people as though they are inferior. And this is the kind of thing that different people who are advertising online or politicians who are promoting themselves online, for instance, the Trump campaign, they did a lot of research on how they utilize this. They utilize those algorithms to make sure that they are particularly disinforming black and Latino communities. Um, and for Facebook, that dynamic means lots of profits because particularly um, those communities that they're talking about are online and being inflamed by it and talking about, well, what about Chicago and black on black crime and other kinds of skewed false narratives? That kind of thing is what keeps people looking at the website. For us, because it's being presented on an online platform, people, we think, well, it must be true. 
You know, if they said COVID could be cured by drinking orange juice once a day, then it must be true because I see it right here on my Facebook. But it's not actually true. And it's even more dangerous for us because, of course, we are more susceptible to COVID for various reasons. So it just becomes a, a, a vicious cycle of being served information that's designed to keep us paying attention. And that's also false. And it makes a lot of money for Facebook. Now, also, at the very same time, social media platforms have democratized the media marketplace. You don't have to have a big budget to go and post on Facebook or to go live on YouTube. And that has been good for us. It's allowed people like Issa Rae and Quinta Brunson and others to get mainstream uh, platforms on your HB HBO and your um, NBC and other places. We've broken through. But what we are seeing from those tech companies now is as they get bigger and richer, they're closing ranks with each other to make it harder for independent creators. Um, getting rid of the net neutrality rules and other kinds of things like that that have been in place. And I could talk about it a lot more, but I know we have to leave. But that's a really great question. And I think um, if you want us to come back and talk big tech, we are all about it. <laughs> so, I hope that helps. so the answer is yes. Go ahead, Bernadette. I was just wondering whether there was time for one more question. Well, there, we can see, you know, when I own the own thing, I can do anything I want, right? Okay. I just don't want to take up as much as time because... Exactly. Well, That's be, what... well, because the thing is, people are short-minded. You know, um, the clicks out there, the, the drops, they'll listen to it later. So we can go. We're definitely going to have these ladies back on. So answer, ask the question, Brenda. Because I don't okay. want to be sued by you anyway. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, well, I wanted to ask you, um, how are you using the media to promote the work of Media 2070? You know, it's interesting. Someone mentioned earlier how reparations as a topic, I think Judge Barber mentioned for a lot of people, it's a non-starter. They don't like that word even. Um, and so for us, we have found definitely that some of our friends in media shy away from speaking about our project uh, because of the fact that we are explicit about reparations. But there are some brave and courageous souls like yourselves, uh, especially independent media makers who have helped us to spread the word and some folks within um, some of the, we call it dominant media or corporate media newsrooms who have helped us to spread the word too. We have partners at News One. Um, I mentioned Essence earlier. Prism is a great newsroom that has covered our work um, and a variety of others. And we, we just keep moving forward and, and pushing forward, trying to make more space, more political cover for those Black folks and our allies in the media who want to talk about reparations, but maybe get pressure in their newsroom from editors and other folks to to not talk about reparations because we know that reparations are inevitable. Reparations will happen and we don't know when, but we know that that is in the future. And, and there are folks that every day with everything that happens in local communities are getting more and more permission to write about it and in turn to write about media reparations. Um, so we've been on a number of podcasts um, in a number of newsletters, especially, um, and, and a few quoted in a few articles in the New York Times, different places like that. But we're most proud of the independent media that have partnered with us. Um, the New Black Times in Tulsa, um, Black by God out of West Virginia, the only black owned newspaper there and folks like that. Okay. Well, um, for, we're going to stay on just a little bit and for the rest of us, um, you just got to come back and, and tune in another time when we have these long videos on. So I'm going to say thank everyone and, and kick everyone off the live show. And um, we'll talk to you later. Thank you, everyone, for listening. You be the judge. We'll see you next Wednesday. And thank you. Bye.